Good morning, folks. Um, Welcome members to the 28th meeting in 2012 of the Subordinate Legislation Committee. As always, ask members to turn off mobile phones, uh, to register the apologies from Jimmy Eady, and to welcome Bruce Crawford to this morning's meeting. Welcome, Bruce. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed the committee takes item five in private. This will be consideration of the evidence we're just about to hear on the Marine Navigation Number 2 bill. Are members content? We are, thank you. Agenda item two is the legislative consent memorandum on the Marine Navigation Number 2 bill. Uh, and this is an opportunity for members to ask questions of the Scottish Government officials on that memorandum. Uh, I welcome from the Scottish Government Stuart Fubishta, Divisional Solicitor of the ECT Division Directorate for Legal Services, Val Ferguson, Policy Executive, and Chris Wilcock, Branch Head for the Ports and Harbours Branch of Transport Scotland. Good morning, one and all. Um, I'm wondering whether I could start by simply asking you, please, what's this all about? And if it's relevant, why is it a private member's bill? Who'd like to lead on, uh, simply on the background as to why we're looking at this, please? Um, the, the bill is a private member's bill, as, you, as you've said. Um, it was originally part of a much larger bill in 2008 uh, on marine navigation and a number of other provisions, which proved to be fairly contentious and was eventually dropped because it didn't uh, gain the relevant support. There were, however, some fairly important provisions within it which have been uh, cherry-picked to some extent, and I believe some of the uh, provisions relating to the uh, the Lighthouse authorities have already been taken forward and uh, by other means, and these ones have been picked up as a handout bill by a private member, but they do have uh, government support and they're widely uh, welcomed by the ports industry. Thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful. Can you, can you give me in one or two sentences what they're really trying to achieve, please? And to some extent, it's part of the deregulation uh, and removing burdens from uh, ports industry. Uh, it's also making things slightly more straightforward for port authorities to either gain or relinquish powers, which they may have to do through private acts and so on uh, at the moment. So they're trying to streamline procedure. Okay, well, we do have a number of questions, um, and I'll start uh, with uh, Mike McKenzie. Good morning. Um, the Scottish ministers with the power to remove harbour authorities' pilotage functions. Um, why does the, the Scottish Government consider these powers are necessary? At the moment, as the legislation stands, um, orders providing pilotage func powers to authorities uh, can be amended or revoked. However, pilotage authorities have been around for quite a number of years and they weren't all created under the existing Pilotage Act. So there isn't actually a current provision to remove the, uh, the duties and powers that uh, relate to pilotage if they're no longer required. So this is really a tidying up uh, of, of putting in the, these powers, should they be required, which is, to be honest, unlikely. We wouldn't necessarily think that they would be used uh, very frequently, but the, it's, it's there should the, the need arise. So, uh, thank you. And that, that brings me on to my next question, which is really the, uh, you know, how does the Scottish Government intend to exercise these powers? We would be uh, reluctant to use them uh, on a proactive basis, and it's very unlikely that we would we would do so. But in in the future, pilotage may or may not continue to be required in a given harbour, and it would be for a pilotage authority to come to us and say, you know, the business has changed. Uh, we we don't no, we no longer require to provide a pilotage service, uh, or to indeed to keep it under review, and we'd like to have the powers completely removed. They would obviously make a case and a risk assessment of those uh, to, to support that case. But, uh, I think it's worth adding that in reviewing any case, one of the primary factors we would consider uh, would be navigational safety alongside any commercial case put forward to us by that particular harbour authority. But I think, as we've said, we, we feel it's unlikely that there will be any approaches along these lines, but it, it makes sense to take the powers in case circumstances change in the future. Yeah, no, thank you. That's insensible. And my, my, my last question, uh, the powers to remove harbour authorities' palliative functions are required to be laid before Parliament, but are not subject to any further procedure. Why do you feel that it's uh, considered that laid-only procedure offers an appropriate level of parliamentary scrutiny? Consistent with, with other 
um, orders under the Pilotage Act. We didn't see any reason to uh, deviate from the consistency of, because orders under the Pilotage Act are subject to that procedure to create a pilotage authority. There's no obvious case to make a change there. Uh, and Only for, for orders under the Harbours Act, which would be the more common uh, legislation taken forward uh, for harbours, um, where we're actually granting and conveying powers, um, the, follow the, the procedure. We're, we're, I mean, we didn't see the need to have anything more onerous uh, for, for this pr proposal. Thank you, Mike. Stephen. Um, it just strikes me, convener, that, that maybe there is a question we should ask before we go too much further on the back of the initial response of where the bill came from. This is a handout bill from the UK government from something that was in 2008. Um, so this is not something directly in the gift of a responsibility of Scottish ministers. We're just looking at the process around the LCM. Can I just therefore ask, in terms of the powers, and we are only interested in subordinate legislation in this committee, perhaps not broader policy issues, to what extent has the Scottish Government been involved in the drafting of what is actually in the bill? In other words, are we asking you to account for something which you've had no influence over in, in the questions we're asking today? Um, no, it's fair to say we had a requisite amount of influence. We saw the bill before introduction and were given the opportunity to input um, to drafting. That's helpful. Thank you, convener. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and something, yes. From a question, just, uh, in terms of uh, relinquishing or removing the, the pilot uh, scheme from any given area, and you, you touched upon the fact that you said that you would take safety into account, who is going to do that for you in terms of who is going to be responsible to monitor and, and safeguard the security uh, uh, safety element? provision um, for us to consult before any order making or removing the powers uh, would be made um, and we would consult with the navigation authorities namely at the moment it would be the likes of the maritime and coast guard agency and other various maritime safety experts that we could consult as we do for other harbours legislation so I, I haven't seen that in any of the documentation so is, is that just you're, you're speaking that from knowledge or is that in fact built in um, I'm, I can't Did you? exactly recall whether it's built There's a, in. a statutory obligation to consult, consult before making an order, um, consult with the Harbour Authority, Authority and anyone else, who, the person making the order, that's the Scottish Minister, thinks appropriate. Right, uh, I think we move on to section 40 with John Scott. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, dealing with uh, the insertion of sections 40A to 40D, and uh, my query is about section 40A, which gives Scottish ministers the power to designate harbour authorities, which may give general harbour direction to ships within entering or leaving a harbour. Section 40D provides that in England and Wales the exercise of this power is subject to the negative procedure. Is the effect of these provisions that in Scotland orders exercising this power will not be laid before the Parliament and will not be subject to any parliamentary control? Again, it's consistent with other orders made under the 1964 Harbours Act, which are not subject to parliamentary procedure, and we saw no reason to deviate from that consistency. Um, well, right. Well, I'm sure you're correct, but. I mean, our view is that, can you explain the reasoning behind this choice of procedure? Because um, we believe that this differs substantially from that applied in England and Wales. So why are we having a different procedure in Scotland? Well, it is the, the current procedure in Scotland is that har harbour orders under the Harbours Act are not laid before Parliament routinely. And, that, and so we've, there's always been this inconsistency yes, the, of approach. There is an inconsistency between Scotland and the rest of the UK, yes. But say we are maintaining um, the consistency it's what, within well Scotland. Enough in the past, would, it, would there be any benefit in having the same approach? Um, or I, not I necessarily? Think it's, it's worked successfully in Scotland. It's worked fine. Yes. OK, right, thanks very much. In, oh, pardon me. In, in that context, the power in Section 40A 
allows the amendment of repeal of a statutory provision of local application, and those words of local application are of some concern to us. Could you explain what you feel they mean in this context, please? Um, they mean what they say that... Do a statutory provision that has application to a particular area rather than applicable throughout the whole of Scotland. Um, the prime candidate here would simply be a, a harbour order, which would uh, have effective operation only within the, the area of the harbour. So you're thinking that something's of local application, if it is not of universal application, it doesn't really matter how local is local. Well, that's helpful. OK, could I then... Forgive me, I'm going to have to read that, read this, but what does the expression of local application mean in this context as it applies in secondary legislation? Has not the concept of local instruments been replaced in the Scotland by exempted instruments, sorry, accepted instruments made under the enactment specified in Section 34 of the Interpretation and Regulatory Reform Scotland Act, to which neither negative or affirmative procedure apply? You know, does it classification of statutory instruments in Scotland has changed and there is no longer a concept of a local statutory instrument. But I don't think that causes any problems with the application of a test of whether a statutory provision is of local application. Um, the change is simply something that goes to, to classification uh, of existing instruments. Okay, let's, let's, let's live with that one. The lawyers worry about that. Thank you. Okay, can I come on to, to Stuart then, please? Uh, my attention is on uh, Section 17A-17F being inserted into the Harvest Act 1964, and in particular the open, opening and uh, cre creation, closure, uh, and revision of uh, harbour orders around harbours. Um, I think, to some extent, the answer to John Scott's question um, covers this, uh, leaving aside uh, harbours of national importance, um, these have always been, I take it, uh, not subject to any parliamentary process. Right, I'm getting nodding heads, so we can pass over that one. Therefore, in relation to harbours of national importance, why has the choice of parliamentary process there been made in the way that it has, where it, it being different? Nothing to do with the bill. You mean the existing arrangements for harbours of national importance? Well, the affirmative order is normally applied to orders to create harbours uh, considered of national importance. Uh, and in relation to uh, sections 17A, 17F that are going in, um, it, 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 is, it remains the same as it's always been. Is that what I'm being told? Yes. The, Closure orders would never have parliamentary procedure on them, even if it was the closure of a, par of a harbour of national importance. Is, 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 is that sensible in the context, since we're in, in a bill here that's tidying up, that if you have to uh, establish uh, a harbour of national importance via an order which is considered by parliament, uh, why is the choice being made that it can then be closed without consideration by parliament? I think that's the essence of the question. I, I think in, in terms of the creation of harbours of national importance, they're usually the harbours designated um, as um, NPF2 projects, the, the Stena uh, and the likes. Um, and obviously given the scale, importance and associated infrastructure in relation to them, it was felt that they needed full parliamentary scrutiny uh, and process. I think any argument or case for closure would be the opposite of that in that by definition, the closure would have to be accompanied, accompanied by uh, an argument that it was no longer of use or indeed of importance. So it, it would be the, the opposite uh, end of the scale from that. Um, I mean, I, I, again, I would suggest it's, it's unlikely uh, that we're going to see many cases along these lines. Uh, and I think it would be particularly unlikely that we'd be looking at any cases where uh, a project that had been designated as national importance uh, would at any point in the near or foreseeable future be coming forward for, for closure? Um, well, let me, let me suggest an example that might, uh, uh, might fall outside that uh, and then pose a question. I, I suspect some of the harbours that are associated with 
the previous oil rig work, which are often new harbours in l remote locations uh, that were used for a comparatively few years and then dropped out of use. Um, now, so, so therefore I think there are examples of where harbours of national importance cease to be of national importance relatively quickly. There may be few in number, but then there aren't many of such harbours. Is it being suggested to the committee that the process by which a harbour of national importance would be closed, and I'm not aware if any of these have been closed, although they may no longer be nationally important, that they would first drop out of the designation of being nationally important, and therefore, when closed, be closed not being harbours of national importance. Is that what's being suggested? Because it does seem slightly perverse that if they were, at the point of closure, still a harbour of national importance, that they're then closed without parliamentary process. I don't think there's any concept of um, remaining on a list of national importance. You get on the list by being on the national planning framework. Well, but, that's but that's precisely my point. The national planning framework is revised. I mean, we're, we're, we're heading towards MPF3, if I recall correctly. Um, and it may or may not have the same things in it that were previously in NPF2. The national planning framework is intended to designate proposed developments, once something's actually done, once it's, it's built, it's not, an, it's not an NPF matter any longer. Right. Let's, let's be really geeky then. It's an NPF too, it's yeah. designated, but it isn't actually done. And yeah. NPF 3 is published without it being present. Mm -hmm. If it were then subsequently done, does it remain of national importance? No. Even though it's not in the then current? The, the test of whether it's of national importance so as, to so as to attract affirmative procedure to the order creating the harbour, if you like, depends on whether at that so, point it is on the national planning framework. So, right, okay, that's fine. So to be quite clear, once something is built and it's of national importance, there is no parliamentary process of delisting it. It remains of national importance in perpetuity. Is the essence of what I'm hearing... Um, Tell me I'm wrong. Well... The, the concept of national importance is one uh, to do with development. It is to do with saying something's of national importance so that it should be built and created. Once it's actually built and created, there's no kind of continuing concept of national importance. In uh, law, uh, it's just a harbour. So, sorry, let me, let me just... <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not seized of that yet because it does appear that if there are harbour revision orders on harbours that was designated of national importance, there is a parliamentary process, process associated with them. So therefore, there is an enduring condition of national importance. Is there not? Otherwise, they would not be caught by that provision. But if the, if the planning frame, if the, the, the next NPF comes out and that, that harbour has already been built, then it will not appear on that. Uh, but are you saying then that if in NPF 3 a harbour that was built under the auspices of NPF 2 yeah. as a harbour of national importance only requires parliamentary procedure for revisions of harbour orders while until the publication of NPF 3 which no longer has that harbour. Yeah. So de facto the consideration by Parliament of NPF 3 which excludes something that was in NPF 2 will relieve that harbour of a parliamentary process for revision orders thereafter. Yes. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yes, that's right. Yes. Right, so uh, I'm, I think this is maybe something the policy committee may wish to pursue a little yeah. further because it does seem a little irrational to me. But, 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 but as I say, we are the sub -ledge committee, not engaging directly in policy. Yeah. Right. I could also possibly add, though, is that the NPF2 designation is for the particular works included and the project included in NPF2. So if that Harbour Authority was coming forward to do something that was not caught by that designation but still required a Harbour order, there could be an argument that it doesn't need the full parliamentary process. It would be whether or not it matches the description in NPF2 that designates the part, that, that puts it down the parliamentary process route rather than any works at that Harbour at all undertaken once it's been requiring a harbour requiring order. harbour order or marine license or anything along those lines. 
Ah, a marine license wouldn't require a harbour. No, no, sorry. Are we are we still on the bill at this point? Yes, John. Yes. Well, he's gone as far as he feels able to go. Whether he's finished or not might be another matter. <laughs> John. Okay. I mean, I may have missed the point in all of this, but I mean, I just seeking an explanation uh, for the choice of procedure of a ministerial order is applicable to the exercise of the power to close harbours and why is a ministerial order appropriate to the closure of harbours not of national importance? Why have you chosen the ministerial order as the power? Can you justify that or just explain it? And you may already have and maybe I've missed it. Uh, because that would be in line with the normal harbour order procedure in, in Scotland for projects that don't fall down, uh, fall, go down the NPF2 route and uh, full parliamentary scrutiny. So it would just be in line with normal procedures for the making of harbour revisions it's, or... It's I mean, orders. as it were. This is, this is this the normal procedure. And given that this, those procedures are in place to uh, empower or create harbours, uh, obviously this is a less significant uh, process where we would be looking at harbours that were no longer required and there was not a case for them, we didn't feel that putting a more uh, onerous uh, or more complex procedure in place was, was required. That's fine. Thank you. Yes. I think that there's an element of unwritten rules being applied here, and I think that's why there's, the clarity is missing. I think um, uh, people in the know perhaps understand and appreciate the norm, the norm that is applied, whereas the legislation doesn't actually clearly state it, and therefore there is a little, a little confusion for, for the layperson. So therefore, I think. A little clarity might be helpful in, in that. It's just about applying common sense here, as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah, I can understand entirely why an order is required and Parliament's going to pass something to create something to happen. But it would be a pretty perverse government who is to decide to close a harbour by ministerial order um, because it, because it can do so under current circumstances without coming to Parliament. And these circumstances would be creating a completely unnecessary bureaucracy to come back to Parliament, because any government closing a harbour, that, for whatever reason in these circumstances it did it, and would be, it would be a perverse decision and against a, a, any natural outcome. So let's just relax about this and, let, you know, and not build in so much bureaucracy we start causing problems for people. And can I ask my question? Can we go into a geeky question? Well, could I, could I deal with eight first, yeah. please? Because could, could I, in this context, come back to the issue of the expression of local application and the power to amend things? Because it would appear in this particular case that it's slightly different because there's the word enactment in there, which in the aforementioned context may therefore only refer to UK parliamentary legislation and not to an act of Scottish Parliament, which wouldn't be an enactment in this context. Has that been considered and does that cause any problems? Yeah, it's, enactment does include an act of the Scottish Parliament here. Section 57.1 of the Harbours Act has a specific definition of enactment, which includes act of the Scottish Parliament. Super. Thank you very much for that clarification. Bruce. Uh, 13 commencement issues. The LCM gives Scottish ministers the powers to commence section 1 and 6 in relation to Scotland. Now, I've got a right, I don't think commence, commencement powers are normal, probably a bit unusual in terms of making incidental provisions. So, therefore, why, why do the government think that, um, consider that a power to make ancillary provisions in connection with the commencement is required in this case? And more specifically, why does the government consider the incidental provisions might be required? Um, I think that would be quite useful to understand that, because this is not a normal way, as far as I understand it. But I think the drafting is not necessarily in line with standard practice in the Scottish Parliament. Um, we would normally attach to commencement order powers the power to make a transitional or transitory provision, including savings. Uh, this, of course, the Westminster Bill. What is in here includes the power to uh, make incidental provision I do not imagine we would uh, make use of that, but we didn't consider it essential to go to the extent of disapplying it for Scotland, which we would have to have done um, if it wasn't to remain in. Which would have meant we'd have lost all the other gains that are in the, the, in the 
well, gains in inverted commas, the gains that are already there, because we effectively would, we would have had to reject the LCM. Uh, no, I mean, we could have kind of specifically that. requested at the drafting yeah. pre-introduction stage of the bill that the fact that the commencement power includes power to make transitional provision, uh, sorry, incidental provision, shouldn't extend to Scotland. But it just, it, just, it doesn't look necessary it's to do that. It's inconsequential, as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm comfortable with that. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, just, just a tiny question. I take it that it's perfectly legal for harbours to exist and operate without any uh, harbour orders of any kind whatsoever to be caught by this. Well, it depends what you mean by operate, in that um, to do the sort of things that harbour authorities need to do to, to regulate traffic, to charge. I, I, was, I was making a, a simpler point that you don't necessarily have to have a harbour authority when you have a harbour. Um, I, I think there, there are examples out there of, of, of harbours where there is no formal harbour authority status that's in it. place. That's all I wanted. Fair enough, thank you. Sorry. Well, Running a harbour if you, you don't have a harbour authority? Yet. No, 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 I beg your pardon. No, the, 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 the question that Bruce was asking, the, the commencement powers one to six. The commencement order made under that would be made in front of the Scottish Parliament. So that's how it would be done. OK. OK. Do members have any other questions? Apparently not. Right, can I say thank you very much indeed? Uh, and uh, we'll briefly suspend just to allow our witnesses to, to go. Thank you. then please. Uh, that takes us to agenda item three, which is instruments subject to negative procedure. And we begin with the court fees miscellaneous amendments, Scotland Order 2012, SSI 2012-322. There's been a failure to lay the instrument at least 28 days before it comes into force, as required by section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform, Scotland Act 2010. Since the purpose of this instrument is to correct errors in various Scottish statutory instruments before they came into force, the committee may wish to find the explanation provided by the Scottish Government for this failure to be acceptable. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting grounds? Jay? Agree. You do. Thank you. That says the purpose of the instrument is to correct those various errors. Um, does the committee find the explanation provided by the Scottish Government for failure to lay the instrument within 28 days, acceptable. Agreed. We do. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the police grant variation Scotland Order 2012 SSI 2012 316, nor on the M74 motorway Fullerton Road to the M8 west of Kingston Bridge. Speed limit regulations 2012 SSI 2012 320. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Yeah. We are, thank you. <coughs> Right, which brings us to agenda item four, which is the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill. Purpose of this item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers in the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill. In considering the bill, the committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the Scottish Government on the delegated powers in the bill. This is suggested that these questions are raised in written correspondence. On the basis of the responses received, the committee would expect to consider a draft report at its meeting on the 18th of December 2012. Section 1.2 enables the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation, SSPO, to issue the Code of Good Practice for Scottish Fin Fish Aquaculture. The effect of that power in the new section 4. A2 to 5 of the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007 is that the farm management agreements and statements must reflect so far as possible any recommendations in the code, and so including recommendations on the various matters set out in subsection 4, such as fish health management. The code also defines the farm management areas in which the requirements apply. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why it has been considered appropriate to confer this power on the SSPO by issue of a code of practice, 
rather than the powers to regulate this matter as being exercisable by regulations by Scottish statutory instrument, and so not subject to scrutiny by the Parliament, nor attracting the drafting and publication requirements which apply to a statutory instrument. Why it has been considered appropriate the powers that power is conferred on the SSPO to define the farm management areas for the purposes of this regime, rather than these being prescribed by Scottish statutory instrument, which again could allow scrutiny by the Parliament. Yeah, great, thank you. The Code of Good Practice recommends good practice measurements, measures, pardon me, for fish farming, and an intention of section 1-2 appears to be that fish farm management agreements and statements will re require to reflect such good practice. Does the committee therefore ask, uh, ask, agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain <coughs> why it has been considered appropriate to enable the Code to include any recommendations determined by the SSPO which the agreements and statements must reflect so far as possible, there being no provision that the Code or any later document shall specify good or best practice measures to be reflected in the agreements and statements. Section 3.1 of the Bill creates a power for the Scottish Ministers to make regulations prescribing technical requirements for equipment to be used for and in connection with fish farming. Further provision can be made to ensure such requirements are complied with. Section 4. 3.4b provides that the regulations may confer functions on any person in relation to the prescribing of requirements. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain how it is anticipated that this power would be exercised and by whom? The minimum requirements to be prescribed by regulations shall attract the criminal penalties and other official enforcement measures which also set out further in the regulations. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why it is considered appropriate that persons apart from Scottish Ministers in regulations subject to parliamentary procedure could be given functions in relation to prescribing these requirements? Section 3.6 provides that the regulations could provide for continuing offences and for any such offences to be punishable by a daily or periodic fine of an amount to be specified in the regulations. Unlike the provision for the maximum penalty for a single criminal offence in Section 3.5, no maximum amount of daily or periodic fine is stated in Section 3.6. Does the Committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why this has been considered appropriate or whether a maximum level of penalty could be specified in Section 3.6? Section 9.1 enables provisions to prohibit or control the movement of any commercially damaging species present or suspected of being present in any body of water. Section 9.2 provides for the matters that may be contained or provided for in an order under Section 9. There is no provision in Section 9 for any maximum time period for provisions for or about the prohibition or control of the movement of species, etc., nor does the list of matters which may be included in an order as set out in Section 9.2 include provision as to the authorised period of controls. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why it is considered appropriate not to include in the Bill any such provisions as to time periods for which the prohibition or control movement of species, etc., will apply? Okay. Okay. Section 14 provides a power for Scottish Ministers to make control screams for control of commercially damaging species on fish and shellfish farms. The orders are not statutory instruments and are not subject to parliamentary controls. Section 14.5c states a control, a control scheme may include incidental, supplemental, consequential, transitional, transitory or saving provision. In the absence of an explanation in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, we have no information on how it is intended that these incidental powers will be used or why they are appropriate without attracting parliamentary procedure. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain, in relation to section 14.5c, why it considers a power to make incidental, supplemental, consequential, transitional, transitory or saving provisions in a control scheme is required, the circumstances in which such powers may be exercised, and why no parliamentary control nor the formal requirements of a Scottish statutory instrument are considered appropriate for such provisions? Section 20 of the Bill, and then Section 44 of, and asserts new Sections 46A to 46G into, the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Consolidation Scotland Act 2003, to introduce good governance obligations on district salmon fisheries boards. 
does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why the power in section 20, inserting section 46F of the Salmon of Fishwater Fisheries Consolidation Scotland Act 2003 is necessary, insofar as it enables any modification, including the repeal of section 44.1 of the 2003 Act, which has the basic requirement for a district salmon and fishery board to prepare annual reports and audited statements of accounts relating to the activities of boards and an annual meeting to consider the report and accounts and how it is envisaged that that power should be exercised. I think about that one because one of the things that certainly struck me since I've become involved in some of the, the work of the committee is we seem to be always whichever government's in power, looking to ways to make it more difficult for people to get things done. And an affirmative process in this circumstance would be more difficult than a negative process for a government to move fast and do things it wants to. I'm all for allowing governments to do what they, you know, to be freed up from bureaucracy, allow them to do things a bit more quickly and not be stuck with diff difficult situations. So I know we're asking a question here, but I don't think the necessarily the end s s nature of it and that it, we should assume that an affirmative procedure would be better than what's currently there. Can I absolutely agree with you, and it might be that the Rural Affairs and Climate Change uh, Environment Committee will agree with you, but can I suggest that's a policy decision which yeah, will be informed by the question? Yeah, when you start drawing people's attention to it, people are inevitably going to start asking questions around about it, and we end up there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would buy I think that's a very sensible comment. I mean, why have they chosen the affirmative instrument for, for this? Yeah, why should it be for something relatively modest? Um, forgive me, I'm, I'm not understanding that. It says, it says under B, given the power to modify provisions act, whether the affirmative procedure is a more suitable level of the scrutiny of the act, which means that you're asking the, them to bring something back to Parliament on every occasion, yeah. rather than allowing them to just go and get it done. And I think it's quite happy. I'm quite happy to allow them to get one and get things done in this small matter even if it modifies the basic requirement of what they're doing? Only, only, in, only in that specific, only in section 21A3C in, of the Act, though. Um, part 5. Uh, forgive me, I think I'm talking about section 20 here. Is this paragraph 96 you're on, is it? Or am I jumped the gun? I think you may have jumped the gun. 85 and 86, I thought you were let's, doing. let's just make sure we know where we are. I've jumped the gun, forgive me. Um, I'm talking about section 20, Bruce. Right. Um, so am I, am I in 22 then, is it? Well, well, you're, you're forewarned when you get to section yeah. 20. <laughs> <laughs> You'd appreciate I can't tell you which section you're on. Um, you might well be. Right, OK. Well, I apologise, but, but John knows where I am, and I'll come back to that. I see, I'm thinking, I'm wondering why you needed the affirmative procedure. In, um, I'm just talking about section 85 and 86. Did you raise the point? 95 and 86? No, right? 85 and 86. 86. I'm wondering why they needed an affirmative procedure. I mean, the same issues, the same issues there. Yeah. Right, okay. Can, 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 I, can I stick, in, in a sense, with where I am? Um, at this point, we're talking about section 20. Same point. Yes. I, 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 I think we're taking the point. Okay. Um, but I, I, I return to, to my point that this is talking about section 20, which does appear to have the power to modify the basic requirements. It may be that uh, clerks can give us it's a the reason why the affirmative procedure is next. Do, do you want to provide us with a response as to why you're happy with the affirmative procedure being required for this? Want to add no, to, to or reflect on it. <laughs> yeah, the suggestion was that essentially because the additional governance, governance requirements are specified in the bill, that in principle, uh, that it's any amendment is textual amendment of the bill. The the, the power in um, the power in section twenty uh, to re to amend section forty four one relates to a requirement which was an initial requirement in the 2003 Act. Uh, so therefore it was just a, essentially a matter of principle that affirmative procedure may be appropriate to textually amend and the recommendation was on that basis. Yeah. 
Are we comfortable that we ask the question? I think we've had lots of points noted on, on, on where it might lead to, and I'm sure that will be drawn to the attention of the Rural Affairs Committee when we get there. Ah, fine. Thanks. Right. Uh, I think I'm still looking for an answer to the question, though, whether you're comfortable with the answer to that question. Thank you. Okay. Section 22 of the bill inserts a new section 21 into the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Consolidation Scotland Act 2003. The regulation power, making power in section 21A1 of that 2003 Act will enable the Scottish ministers to put in place a statutory scheme for carcass tagging of wild salmon. New section 21A3 states that the regulations may make such modifications of part 5 of this Act as the Scottish ministers think fit. Part 5 confers powers on ministers by regulations to impose charges in connection with carrying out the fisheries function. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why the power in the new section 21A3C of the 2003 to make such modifications of the Part 5 of this Act as the Scottish ministers think fit is appropriate? Why it could not be framed as a power to make such modifications which are consequential on making regulations under the new section 21A1? How it's envisaged this power could be used. Perhaps if we stop there. And given the power is to modify provisions in the Act, whether the affirmative procedure is a more suitable level of scrutiny for the exercise of this specific power, bearing in mind once again it's the modification of an Act. Yeah. I think it's, I, I'm sorry, for, sorry for my confusion earlier, convener, but this is this is the one I was addressing properly. Right, well, uh, let me bring, uh, let's just state the principle, let's just reiterate the principle. In general, we've said negative procedure is appropriate unless you're changing the text of an act when affirmative procedure is appropriate. That's That's been our default. No. John? Well, I would just like to say I'm not sure if Bruce sat on this bill in, in 2003, but I certainly did, and at that time I suggested that fish should be tagged to the ridicule of the then government, I have to say, and I'm now delighted to see that it's being introduced uh, even at this late stage. Well, I can confirm that it's being talked about, yes. <laughs> were you on, we were on that. I'm on the committee, don't worry. I no, should we, we see lots of this. You were, are you off the committee? I can't remember, I can't remember John. Transport. A far better member than me. Environment committee at that time. Thank you. Well, let's ask the question, but I just make the general point that we should be trying to make things easier for people in difficult circumstances that the world finds itself in just now, and that includes government, rather than trying to bind them up with all sorts of rules and regulations that keep them, them require them to come back to Parliament. That also gums up the parliamentary process. I, I don't think with respect that that is any part of our process or well, any part of our intention it, that the question is being asked. I'll, I, I, I see the question, but if it ends up in a affirmative procedure, that's what If you draw it to the attention of the policy committee, that's where it might end up. But anyway, I, I accept the question. Thank you. Section 28.3 inserts a new pro section 33B into the 2003 Act. <coughs> this enables Scottish ministers to make provisions by regulations to recall to Scottish ministers or restrict DSFB functions when consenting to the introduction of salmon or salmon spawn into inland waters under section 33A of the 2003 Act. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to clarify in relation to the powers in section 28.3, how section 33A3A was added to that Act. Section 33A was added by the Agriculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007, but that addition did not include a subsection 3A. There is a question in there. Are comfortable to ask that? Thank you. Section 51 confers a power on the Scottish Ministers which will enable them to make regulations for or about the imposition of charges in connection with the carrying out of fisheries functions, which will also be specified in the regulations. Section 52 defines the functions in relation to which Scottish Ministers may impose a charge. These are functions of the Scottish Ministers under any legislation relating to fish or shellfish farming, salmon or freshwater fisheries, or sea fishing. It also covers functions of persons appointed or authorised by ministers to enforce the legislation, such as sea fishery officers. It extends to functions under domestic and EU legislation. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain 
why it is necessary for the scope of the powers to extend widely to all types of functions set out in Section 52 under domestic and EU legislation, given that the Delegated Powers Memorandum suggests the regulations will impose charges in connection with certain specific fishery functions, and so why it is not it would not be appropriate for the Bill to specify, sorry, to prescribe those specific functions for which they would be charging, possibly with a power to modify or add to them. Okay. How is it envisaged that these powers would be exercised and in relation to which functions beyond the list of matters which can be covered in regulations in section 53? Given that these are significant new powers to impose charging across a wide range of fisheries and fishing functions, why the affirmative procedure would not offer a more appropriate level of scrutiny by the Parliament on the exercise of the powers rather than the proposed negative procedure, in particular for the selection of the specific functions for which the charging regime would apply. The power in section 51.2, inserting section 25.2BA of the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007, permits any amendment of the definition of relevant offence for the purposes of fixed penalty notice provisions in that section 25. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain, given that the Delegated Powers Memorandum does not explain why the power to amend the definition of relevant offence in any way is required, could the scope of this power be drawn more narrowly? And does the committee agree to raise all these questions in writing? We do. Thank you for your patience. I think that completes agenda item four. That moves us to agenda item five, which is in private. Thank you very much.